Good morning, I'm Robert Alkman and welcome to the May Wednesday Morning Roundtable Program. Thanks to our membership, we appreciate your support. To learn more, please visit auburndowntown.org and click on the Roundtable tab. Today's topic is the state of Owasco Lake and COVID impacts. Joining us is moderator Guy Constantino, Director of Cucum Community College Foundation, Audrey Iwanaki, owner of Owasco Paddles, Dr. Adam Effler, Executive Director of Owasco Lake Watershed Management Council, and Chris Nusserino, Executive Director of the Auburn and Skinny Atlas YMCAs. Guy, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Robert, and welcome to all three of our panelists. Uh, just a little bit of uh, background and some housekeeping beforehand. Uh, we'd like to also thank our three sponsors, and we'll thank them at the end as well. Uh, it is Tompkins Trust, uh, who has been a supporter over the last uh, several years, and we'll thank them for their generous support to keep the Wednesday uh, morning roundtable uh, running, as well as the Allen Family Foundation and the Fred L. Emerson Foundation. And they, we appreciate their support. Uh, we hope this is the last of our Wednesday morning roundtables that is remote. We would hope <laughs> that we will be at Westminster uh, church uh, around the Loop Road next to, uh, oddly enough, the, the YMCA uh, in uh, uh, September with a whole slew of programs. We'll talk about that with you at the end of this uh, broadcast, but uh, we have really had some success with the Wednesday morning roundtable with COVID, uh, both with uh, Jesse Klein, who is our coordinator, coordinating all this, as well as Robert Hoffman, making us all look and sound good. Uh, we'll still utilize their services in the fall, but uh, for the time being, uh, because of COVID, and that's where we're going to kind of get into what we're doing today, uh, COVID has impacted a lot of us in, in different ways, both good and bad, believe it or not. Uh, some people had a really good year. Uh, we'll talk about that. She's smiling. It's the one person <laughs> who was smiling on screen. Um, she had a good year because people had to adapt. Uh, but we want to also talk about what water quality is and how it impacts uh, the operations of not only Wasco Paddles, which is a for-profit business, but we also have a not-for-profit that has uh, several different types of operations uh, on Wasco Lake in different forms. Uh, they have a, a resident camp and day camp uh, at uh, the south end of the lake, uh, but they also run at Emerson Park Little League, Pony League, and Mustangs, and how COVID has impacted their seasons last year and some things that are changing this year. And we thought we would bring Adam Effler, Dr. Effler, back into the, to the discussion. He's been with us in the past uh, through Wasco uh, Lake Water Management Council, which has uh, done a lot of research and also gathering data. So we want to talk about what the, the year looks like ahead is as we take this on Monday the 10th, it's soggy. And soggy will have an impact on what those numbers are come the, uh, summer and fall. So again, welcome. Chris Nusserino has been the executive director of the YMCA uh, since uh, January 1st, 2015. Uh, he has operation, as we said, both at uh, uh, southern part of Wasco Lake, but also at the foot of Wasco Lake at Emerson Park. But more importantly, he runs the Auburn Y and the Skinny Atlas Y. We have Audrey Iwanaki, who uh, many of people in our community know her from a variety of different uh, locales and from some beautiful artwork in downtown. If you so see those, uh, those reels of film that are in the park uh, next to the Auburn Public Theater, that is Audrey Iwanaki's real passion and that's art. But she is also the owner and operator of Owasco Paddles uh, and she has owned the company since uh, 2014. And then we also have Dr. Adam Epler, who is with the Owasco Lake uh, Watershed Management Council. I always have to look down when I'm saying that large. <laughs> he is not AOLA, that is a different organization. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Epler came uh, to this community in the middle of 2019. So he's just celebrating his second year. He oddly enough has an office about six doors from mine here at the Community College. Um, but uh, he is, uh, looking at the data and how Wasco Lake to make sure that we don't have problems with blue green algae and other items, but I'm not gonna take his, his steam from him. So welcome all three of you. Uh, I'd really like to start with Chris Nuzzarino talking about uh, from the not-for-profit perspective, 
of how COVID affected you last year, how it's going to affect you this year, and also how lake quality has affected you, because I know at the end of last year, it did. So welcome. Thanks so much for having me here today, Guy. Thanks for moderating and Robert putting this all together. And Jesse, just being Jesse, thanks <laughs> for your coordination. Appreciate it. I know it's been a difficult time and, and pulling uh, Wednesday morning roundtables off during a pandemic uh, has gone beautifully. So well done. Um, last year, like most folks, uh, what a struggle uh, last year was uh, day to day. Uh, honestly, was was the issue for us uh, as new mandates would come out. We had no idea what would be happening at, at any time, and that that really started off for us uh, last year with camp. Um, other than the Y closing for a couple of months, um, camp Wyawasco, which has been um, in existence for a very long time and it has met the needs of many many children and families was no resident camp last year. Um, that was shut down. We were notified um, late May uh, that that was not going to happen. Um, we were trying to attempt to see if we could and what rules and regulations there would be. Fortunately, uh, day camp did happen uh, last summer. Um, and to see uh, how we've progressed from the COVID rules that, at that time to this time, has been really interesting to see. Uh, day camp last summer, um, if you could imagine during that pandemic when uh, everybody was pretty much shut down, we were one of the few areas where kids could actually come together uh, under the emergency childcare provisions of the COVID rules uh, for working parents that they could actually come together um, and play and, and be together uh, and not, not only be together, but at Camp Wyawasco with the lake, the view, the woods, everything that we have to offer out there was pretty tremendous uh, experience. And, and quite frankly, really helped those kids get through uh, that summer of, of COVID uh, where they weren't seeing their traditional friends um, during that time. So uh, a lot of hearts were broken because resident camp did not happen. Um, I, we really saw the impact on uh, kids and families and staff uh, not having a resident camp uh, last summer. That's where memories are made, the overnights, the waking up in the morning early, the showering, the, the breakfast, the camp sing-alongs, you know, all that uh, really um, was missed. Um, so it was very unfortunate for those kids, but those kids love camp so much that they chose to sign up for day camp. Some of the protocols around Camp Wyawasco, busing was an issue. Uh, we had to limit uh, the number of kids on a bus, which meant we, have to, we had to uh, spend more money on buses and we were able to seek the funding to do that from our, our local gen generosity of our local uh, community uh, to help make that happen. Um, uh, uh, staff had to wear masks. We had to buy uh, wipes to wipe everything down. I mean, everything all the businesses have, have gone through, we had to go through. In addition to that, our group sizes shrunk. So um, the number of kids that could be together uh, and with a group got smaller, uh, which meant we needed more staff to hire last summer too. But it, it was important for us to, to give those kids that opportunity. Uh, this year, uh, at camp, it is going gangbusters. Uh, the governor uh, about a month and a half ago said resident camp could happen. So we are planning the best we possibly can. Now here's the trick, the regulations on how to operate that have not come out yet. <laughs> so we are uh, doing the best we can with uh, using our common sense uh, and planning for it, uh, but not until those regulations come out will we know exactly how to pull that off. So day camp, I think we're pretty comfortable with. Resident camp, we anticipate some restrictions, uh, turning the bunks, you know, head to foot uh, opposite each other, um, probably less number of kids in a bunk uh, as well. So uh, we'll manage. Uh, Kanga, uh, Melissa Kartner, our camp director is phenomenal. 
Uh, she is on top of it, and we're excited about this summer. It's, it is going to be jam-packed, as you can imagine. Uh, most kids and parents are ready to do something fun and exciting in camp. For some of them, will be their first experience doing it. Uh, it as far as uh, the water, um, every year for us, um, the lake has been an issue. Uh, the green algae uh, sometimes gets us sometimes passes us, um, but most likely we've had some experience with uh, the algae during the summer where we've had to shut down our, our waterfront, which means we can't swim, uh, we can't canoe, uh, none of that is happening. Uh, our inflatables that we have out there in the water can't be used. So uh, we find alternative uh, means for that. Um, we have also in the past, uh, drawn water from the lake and treated it and, uh, and then uh, utilized it for cooking and, and serving water, uh, just like um, a mu municipality, really, quite frankly, we had the same treatment center only on a smaller scale to do that. Last year, uh, with it being COVID, uh, it was an opportunity for us to see what we could do without doing that. So we actually partnered with our uh, local uh, water company called Waterboy, and uh, they've come and fill up our tanks uh, once a week, and that's how we're able to use use um, our, our facilities and, and showering and so on for the kids. So drinking water. So we still have to do some treatment of it, but not as intensely for us, and that's been a, a real uh, kind of a lifesaver for us in all on all reality because of the unpredictable predictability of the lake um, with the algae. It's just, we, we don't want to get anyone sick at any time. So uh, we've, we found a solution for that. Um, I'll touch base on uh, Little League. Uh, we're out at Emerson Park and again. Last summer uh, was a, a weird uh, summer. Uh, again, uh, we were able uh, to pull off uh, a Little League uh, sporting event last summer which wasn't happening. Uh, most little leagues in the area canceled their seasons. Uh, we had such strong leadership on the little league board in Auburn. Uh, they made all the protocols uh, happen. Uh, for example, no umpire behind home plate, had to go behind the pitchers down. Only three kids in the dugout. Every other kid lined up on the fence six feet apart. Uh, if you were off the field, you had to wear a mask. Spectators were limited. Uh, they had to wear a mask. And of course, everything was being cleaned. Uh, enrollment was down a bit uh, because of, of COVID. But uh, again, we were able to provide a, a great family and uh, kid experience last summer. And quite frankly, that's really due to the, the volunteers and the board and uh, what they pulled off. In particular, Frank Mancuso, who was the president last year. Uh, was bound and determined to have a season, and he did, and did a great job leading that group. So uh, this year, uh, Little League, uh, as Guy knows, uh, kicked off, uh, not this Saturday, the last Saturday, we had opening day. Um, some protocols are still in place uh, for full folks, but uh, we, we feel very comfortable with the season so far. Uh, now we can just get the, uh, the weather straightened out. A little bit looks looks good this week. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> no snow this week, so so we're adapting uh, and and doing everything that we can uh, in both those two areas. So. Thank you. Uh, we'll have some questions for you at the end, but uh, uh, thanks to uh, for Chris Newsroom for giving us an update on not only what's going on at the camp, but also what is going on at uh, Emerson Park. Someone who's up at Emerson Park, and I'm not sure you are. You open right now, Audrey Iwanaki? We need to have your mic come back on. But Audrey Iwanaki is the owner of Owasco Paddles. Are you open yet? Uh, generally, we say we'll open weekends in May if we have a nice weekend. It's been at least five years since we had a weekend in May that was warm enough for us to even think about it. Um, but we open. Um, Memorial Day weekend, that Friday, full time until Labor Day. Um, so that's generally when we're open. Uh, 
We say we'll open in September, but because of the blue-green algae, we have not had a September where we could be open in quite some time. Um, I, I did a little visual history. It might be a little overboard. I can share it with you. Carla and Marty Connolly were the ones that, that started Owasco Paddles in 2013. They started out with 11 kayaks, two canoes, and I think three paddle boards and a paddle boat. Um, when Lori and I took over in 2014, they had gotten three more paddle boats. So we had a ton of paddle boats. And what they started out with, we came up with our t-shirts with our slogan. Um, and this picture was taken at the end of September of our first year. So it was September 28th. We were able to be in the water that long. Following year, we had our first intern. It's going to click right through. Just um, we sort of kept adding. We had the um, kitty kayaks and more canoes. We bought the Hobie kayaks and our, our boathouse got pretty stuffed. Um, so in 2015, we had many more paddle boards and we were beginning to understand that we needed to be able to competently teach people how to do it. So we got certified for, um, by the American Canoe Association to teach paddle boarding. Um, and we redid our boathouse, we reconfigured it so we could actually fit things in. Um, so then we were able to competently teach people how to paddleboard, and um, that was one of Lori's biggest things. That was the thing she really loved to do. That year, the no, 2016, we did try opening a second location at Frontenac Park, but there was not a lot of um, foot traffic. So we ended up bringing the boats back over to Owasco Lake, but that year in 2016, the lake level was so low, we actually had to moor our boats offshore because there's a sandbar that you would run right into 10 feet offshore. Um, so we, and we discovered that the sit on top um, kayaks were the way to go for most beginners because you can get in and out of them easily. So as, and we added more paddle boards, but, ev and we, you never know who you're gonna see at Alaska <laughs> Paddles. We had some visitors, we had some rescues with boats and birds. Um, but then we, we did start seeing blue green algae along the shore, probably in about 2016 or 2017. Um, one of those years, they actually were, oh, and we try to keep the, um, the shoreline clean to help keep that from forming because when it, it's there, it does contribute. Um, but this is September now, every year since, since then. Um, and we'll just keep going. Um, so this is my crew that has been with me for quite some time. When we talk about um, COVID, Caleb, the guy right in front, was a teacher and he lost his job. It was his first year. He lost his job. So he ended up working at Walmart during the summer. And um, we ended up, I think this is pretty much done. Can we stop sharing? Um, we did not know that we could open at Owasco Paddles until three days before Memorial Day weekend. So I was kind of not prepared. I, my staff was not prepared. We had no idea really. Plus I couldn't be up there. I was taking care of my mom and she was, she's in her nineties. So I was unable to be at Owasco Paddles. Um, I just didn't feel comfortable being around the public and then trying to take care of her. But so we opened three days a week last year. I had Caleb for one day, I had Nikki for one day, and I had Emerson for one day, and then kind of filled in with new people. But as it turns out, because people couldn't go anyplace else, and this was the one thing they could do outside, we almost doubled what we normally would do in a summer. Um, sorry. 
I know. That's the prison city phone. <laughs> Don't take any orders. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyways, um, so we were open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we were busy from morning till night. As long as, and we also, it was one of the hottest summers on record. So not only did people have no place else to go, they wanted to get out on the water as well. We found that we got a lot of people from like Rochester and Utica and a lot of people that had friends in either one of those places would meet at Emerson Park in Auburn and um, go out. We had some families from Rochester that were there every weekend. Hmm. So, um, you know, on the one hand, it limited us because my, uh, I had staffing issues. On the other hand, we, you know, it was um, one of the best summers we've had. So uh, thank you for your presentation. We'll turn over now to uh, Dr. Adam Epler, the Executive Director of the Wasco Lake Watershed Management Council. Kind of give us an overview of what maybe has occurred in the past, but what you're also looking at for this year and how it will impact both for-profits in the sense of Audrey Wanaku. We have some businesses on the lake, a restaurant at the foot of the lake, and also obviously it's gonna impact, it may impact campers. Uh, whether they want to swim or uh, dive or do other, other things there. So, Doctor, welcome. Good morning, Guy. Thank you for welcoming me back to the roundtable once again. Uh, it's great to see you, uh, Jesse and, uh, uh, and Robert, and uh, pleased to meet you, Audrey and, and Chris. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion so far. Owasco Lake and its watershed have been the focus of ongoing water quality research uh, due to the lake's poor water quality in comparison with neighboring Finger Lakes. The ongoing monitoring effort has highlighted some salient points. And some of the points that I'll share were drawn from our 2020 lake report from our leading limnologist, Dr. John Halfman of Hobart William Smith Colleges. Uh, first off, and I think this is most important to, uh, to this group, the lake has experienced late uh, summer and early fall blooms of cyanobacteria, or otherwise known as blue-green algae. Uh, the cyanobacteria are a concern due to their uh, affiliation with impaired water bodies, their ability to form unsightly surface scum, if you will, um, and more importantly, some species of cyanobacteria may produce toxins uh, that have health implications for humans and other warm-blooded organisms. Now, there are a handful of drivers that have been determined through correlation analyses. There are only a couple of drivers of harmful algal blooms that we can control, uh, one of them being the further spread of invasive species that uh, appear to have a prominent impact on occurrences of HABs. And more importantly, the loading of phosphorus, which is a, a primary nutrient uh, that is loaded to the lake system. Phosphorus is com uh, considered the limiting nutrient to the lake. Uh, and Guy and, I, Guy and I have spoken on this previously. The limiting nutrient is the nutrient in lowest quantity relative to an organism's need for growth. So that is if you limit phosphorus, you will limit the growth of the organism. And in this case, uh, the growth of, of HABs. Uh, so uh, nutrient sediment sources to the lake, uh, which influence the overall water quality include point sources like the wastewater treatment facility uh, and onsite wastewater septic systems that we have on some of the lakeshore properties. Uh, and more importantly for this system, non-point sources like animal and crop farms, lawn fertilizers, soil erosion, stream bank erosion, uh, roadside ditches, drainage tiles, construction activities, you name it. Uh, and the reason that it's more that that is a more prominent feature for phosphorus loading to the lake system is that 
the that Owasco Lake, its watershed to lake ratio is 20 to 1. It is the largest watershed to lake ratio of in, any of the Finger Lakes. And that makes it very susceptible to what's called non-point source pollution. That's pollution coming off of the landscape within the drainage basin. Uh, streams and tributaries are the primary source of nutrients and sediment to the lake, uh, especially during wet years. The large nutrient and sediment inputs, particularly during the years of 2011, 2014, and 2015, were coincident with and may have triggered the onset, uh, onset of the recent cyanobacteria blooms. And Owasco Lake was the first to have documented and reported tabs of all the Finger Lakes. That was in 2016. So this is a relatively new phenomenon. That said, cyanobacteria are the most ancient life form on the planet. They are the most important producer. And when I say producer, not only does that mean growing algae, but the way production is measured is in the production of oxygen. And it's actually a very important organism. It produces more oxygen on the planet uh, than any of the forests combined. Uh, so cyanobacteria is a good thing, uh, but, but not so much the toxic forms. Uh, what else shall I share? So, so in, in, since 2011, the estimated annual phosphorus budgets for Owasco Lake initially revealed larger inputs than outputs. So there's a continued net accumulation of phosphorus in the lake. Uh, and that is when um, inputs exceed outputs. Um, and that would continue to degrade water quality. But since 2016, the balance has turned and inputs have become uh, similar or smaller than the outputs. There appears to be a turning of the tide really, uh, which is great to see. And I think it's through collective uh, efforts and, and actions of many partners who seek to protect the watershed in the lake and also the advancement of best management practices for the agricultural community. So again, phosphorus is the target. We need to continue reducing phosphorus loading to significantly improve water quality for the lake. Uh, now let's talk about wet and dry years. So for 2020, last year, I think all of us would uh, um, consider 2020 a, a dry year. It was significantly below uh, normal uh, in terms of rainfall, it was actually 50, 56% below normal. Uh, so there were, uh, yet there were nearly six fold more DEC, uh, that's the New York State Department of Environmental Con uh, Conservation, documented HABS occurrences in 2020 than 2019. So then you ask, so why more HABS, HABS occurrences if it's a dry year? We know that phosphorus loading is really driven by flow conditions. Yet, we think that the dry conditions allow for more uh, decomposition of shoreline macrophytes, otherwise known as weeds, that can then promote these spatially and temporally discrete harmful algal blooms. Meaning these, these harmful algal blooms, they pop up uh, seemingly randomly in space in different locations uh, around the lake, seemingly random in time, although there do seem to be more commonly uh, HABs occurrences near those lakeshore areas where there have been uh, macrophyte, macrophyte decomposition. Uh, so it was wonderful to hear Audrey comment that they do rake up the, uh, the, the, the macrophytes along the shoreline that can help reduce some of those, those remote harmful algal blooms. So good work there, Audrey. Uh, the last comment that I'll make is updated regulations to improve water quality and agricultural best management practices in the watershed were recently highlighted in the community consensus Owasco Lake Watershed Rules and Regulations revisions. And this was undertaken by Keegan County Planning Department, the Owasco Lake Watershed Management Council, and really on behalf of the city of Auburn, the town of Owasco, they are the two leading water purveyors for the lake. Uh, but of course, on behalf of the entire community that stands to benefit from watershed protection. Uh, this was a collaborative public effort by numerous state, county, and local groups and other stakeholders within the watershed, uh, really to, to come to a consensus on what we believe are common sense watershed regulations. And, and with that, I think that, that that provides my update for the section, and I'm, I'm looking forward to a Q&A. So, Doctor, let me thank you. Uh, let me start with you just on a couple of uh, quick items. Um, I think everyone has waited with bated breath 
tell us what the coming year is going to look like. What's your what's your magic eight ball or magic uh, globe say we should be looking at this year? Well, I think it's important to consider the fact that harmful algal blooms are still not well understood. This is a, a, a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, and we observed in 2020 over 130 documented uh, HABs occurrences that were reported through the DEC's uh, web portal. Uh, and it was, again, many fold more than had ever been seen previously. And you know, it, one of the challenges here is, of course, there's what, what's called samplers bias, right? And so you have more indications of blooms when there are more people out monitoring. Uh, and so, and that's a hard thing to capture uh, and to remove from, from our analysis. Uh, but in terms of um, outlooks for the year, this is, I would say, uh, a marathon, not a sprint. And the reason I say that is we're talking about the need for long-term reductions of the limiting nutrient phosphorus. There's no easy way to say specifically what any uh, field season or single year will bring in terms of harm harmful algal blooms, uh, especially when we see that there's an effect of increased nutrient loading uh, with higher flow conditions, but yet that dry conditions might also promote localized blooms due to rotting vegetation. Uh, it's very, very hard to predict, Guy. So before turning to Audrey about some of the things that she's doing, I, I did want to follow up on, uh, so uh, personally, you have utilized Alaska paddles and, and it's kind of been a starter for a lot of people who bought their own boats, especially now that they uh, are changing their, their work and life patterns and where they are at home. But one of the things that you will see outside of where Owasco Paddles is in, at the foot of the lake is sometimes there's a weed whacker out there. I know it's not that's not the technical name, but there's a weed harvester out there. Um, does that help uh, reduce algal blooms? Does it have any impact on that as well? Is that question directed to me, Doc? To you, to you, Doc, yes. Okay. Yes, it does. Yeah. So, uh, so from a point of logic, so, so phosphorus is, uh, is a mass loading nutrient, meaning it, it gets taken up uh, within the vegetation itself. And so when you remove vegetation from the lake, you indeed are removing phosphorus mass from the lake. So that is a good thing. And of course, there is a sort of um, multi-level benefit there whereby there's improved then access for Owasco paddles as well. So I, I do support that effort, Audrey. So does that mean that there should be more weed harvesting? Uh, should resources be put into that as well? Uh, not, only, uh, not only at the foot of Owasco Lake, but throughout. I, I, I remember being, as a kid up at, at the Y camp, there would be, you know, it's so only so far you would go out past the, the raft and there would be weeds there as well. I, I do believe that weed harvesting is a practical objective, one of many for, for lake and watershed management. Uh, it is one that we're currently reviewing with Senator Mannion of the 50th district there um, uh, overseeing Auburn. Um, and Hopefully it's something that he can see as an opportunity to tie in programming for multiple finger lakes uh, because you know these these devices can be used um, and transported. So uh, hopefully we're trying to tie that in with uh, with a project with Skinny Atlas and Atisco Lakes as well. and we'll see we'll see where we go on that project. Thank you. So Audrey, a question about last summer you, you mentioned that you know, you were one of those few places where people could congregate, and when and you should qualify that. I'm assuming people were congregating with masks. Right. They were following. You had a number of safety protocols out there. Whether right. they were for you and Owasco Paddle uh, patrons or other people, because I almost think that Owasco Paddles tended to be a starter. People tried it, and then they went and they went either to Amazon or Walmart or Jacks and they bought their own paddles or boats or, or whatnot. Um, was that the case where people would start with you and then, because there were a lot more people up there than just those coming to your business. Um, 
there are a lot more people up there than just coming to our business. Um, I think one of the other problems with last year for people was that because so many people were looking for outdoor equipment, it was nowhere to be found. Um, you had decreases in production due to COVID and you had, you know, a huge demand. So for some people, we were kind of the only game in town and we did on shore require masks and we um, had a solution that we rinsed everything off with all the boats, all the paddles, all the um, life jackets after each use. Um, we did have extra masks if people came up and didn't have one so that we, you know, we had them right there available for people. So we, we did have our own safety protocols. Um, oftentimes what happens is people come and they try things out with us. They might wanna try a different kind of boat with us. They might wanna, you know, try a paddleboard for the first time. And then they will go and buy their own equipment. Um, for some people, it's just that we're so convenient. All they have to do is show up and we have everything there for them. So, you know, you get both. Um, I think what happens is people, a lot of people with us um, are, start out. So they, they really don't have a lot of experience. They don't know what kind of boat they want. Um, when they do figure that out, then they will go and purchase their own. And for somebody who has not gone there roughly, you loan them out for half hour, hour, how many hours, and how much do they um, We, Well, an, an hour, we start out with an hour. We have half day and whole day rates as well. Um, so, you know, pretty much however much time you want to spend. We do rent them off site. So if people are um, renting a camp or something, we will deliver, um, you know, so it's, so if I wanted to do a paddle boat, uh, a paddle board for an hour, how much would it cost? $20. Okay. So a great deal for just, if you want to get out there and just yeah. get out there in, in the sun. Right. Uh, and we do, um, we like having people bring their dogs. So we're right there by the dog park. So you can take your dog to the dog park. You can take them out on a paddle board or in a kayak. Um, a lot of times people will bring small children. We have small seats that we can put in a single kayak to make it easier for a parent with one child to take them out rather than try and put them in a bigger boat. Um, we do have tandem kayaks, but if you're like a, a parent with one small child, that's gonna be difficult for you to maneuver a two person boat. And do most of the people stay uh, in the Doville? And I ask that only because it is sandy. There is a sandbar there. Sometimes right. it does get weedy. Uh, so I'm looking at Dr. Epler. Uh, but I do know that some people go down that little tributary. It right. goes beyond the, the gas, beyond the gas station out to the outlet. And mm -hmm. then it's a hard paddle. At least for me, it's a hard paddle up, uh, <laughs> up, up the seawall. Um, is that where people mainly stay for you? Um, well, you know, we don't have any boundaries. The boundary is the edges of the lake, you know, or the, the river. You can go down the river, although in the spring, especially if we've had some rain early in the season, we discourage people because um, if we've had a lot of rain and they have the floodgates open, uh, right by White Bridge Road gets pretty dicey, right under the bridge there. So, so doctor, before I go to Chris and Serena with some questions, when... Um... So we ended up, I will tell you from personal experience, we used uh, Alaska paddles and we ended up investing in two inflatables to my horror some days. But with that being said, how do you post or how does the county post when there is blue-green algae or algal blooms where people should be? Because I will say that I think that we paddle in September where Audrey may not, uh, and Alaska paddles may not have been open because of how does how does the rest of the public know? Is that up to Emerson Park personnel to tell people don't go in the water? That's a great question, Guy. So the way that that works is if there is a documented bloom, the Cayuga County Health Department in this case is responsible for the beach closure. Uh, at the public access points, there there is required signage 
uh, that documents the HABs and what to look for. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the fact that HABs occurrences are spatially and temporally discrete makes it very difficult for water quality managers to recommend uh, specific locations within the, within the lake and times that users would be considered more or less safe. Uh, so, so from my point of view, I typically echo the, uh, the, the state DECs uh, phrase on, on this topic, and that is to know it, avoid it, and report it. Uh, so if there's any opportunity uh, for the YMCA uh, and for uh, customers of, of Owasco Paddles to, to become more informed via education of what to look for, I think that, that that's an important step in the right direction. Thank you. So speaking of the YMCA, so when you're up at camp and forget COVID for a second, and I know you'll still have to deal with those protocols, but you, since you've been here in 2015, you've had to deal with lake quality issues. Does that mean that most parents front load their children attending, whether it's overnight or day camp in July versus in August? Do you see a, do you see a drop off then? Yeah, a great question. Um, not, not really, no. Uh, camp is quite popular throughout the, the entire season. In fact, in August, it gets a little bit more busy, actually, because uh, it's the last hurrah. A lot of folks have taken some vacations in July and August is that preparation for school. So um, it's pretty consistent throughout, um, I would say, but maybe even a little more heavily loaded in August, early August there. So uh, knowing that you had a couple of uh, uh, blue-green incidents last year, uh, what's the procedure? How does the why find out? And what do you do? What are your procedures? Uh, and then when do you make the determination? Can you open back up? Yeah, great. Uh, well, we've become very accustomed to it. Um, our camp staff are familiar with what it looks like. Our kids are familiar <laughs> with what it looks like. Our camp director is as well. So we'll be uh, very cautious uh, when we suspect that there might be a bloom uh, either in the area or approaching our area. Uh, we'll inform the, the county health department. Uh, we are regulated by the health department and uh, we work with them uh, on the assessment of it. And then they, once we are closed down, uh, they give us the okay to reopen after they've uh, done their testing and their-, their so Do you test for it or does the county test for it or it's just an ass a visual assessment? Uh, the county uh, handles that. Okay. And yeah. uh, so you mentioned uh, some protocols and last year it was a tough year because you couldn't do overnight camp. Uh, so there are expenses that go into operations and when you're closed down as you were as a building for some time in the spring and in yeah. the summer. Uh, how do you deal with those expenses and do you foresee this year COVID related expenses that you're going to have to make investments in that you didn't plan, let's say in 2019? Yeah, last year, uh, all the, um, uh, sanitizing equipment uh, that we ended up purchasing, uh, wipes, uh, antibacterial uh, uh, hand sanitizer, soap, hand washing, all that stuff, masks. Uh, again, we were uh, very fortunate to, to rely on some local uh, community foundation uh, support. Uh, the city of Auburn had some grant funding through the CDBG. Uh, opportunity that helped us, um, transportation, uh, United Way and the Cuga Community Foundation uh, were supportive of us uh, as well through those. This year, um, I think a lot of folks are prepared more now for it. So kids have hand sanitizer, they have masks, uh, staff have masks. Um, we're still unsure a little bit on the protocols for transportation uh, from our bus stops uh, around the community that we serve and bring the kids out to camp for day camp. Um, uh, so we'll, that's, that's to, be, to be determined. But that's driven up costs. I mean, your, your costs for camp have gone up and you obviously have to oh, pass yeah. it on to, to parents and, and whatnot. 
or those who are paying for CAM. Uh, so that that's a driver there for those extra expenses, whether it's busing or yeah. safety. Uh, did you, and I guess this would be for both you and uh, Audrey Wanaki, uh, obviously um, there's a little bit of a debate uh, depending on where you are in the, the political divide about masks, uh, whether that's my personal opinion is that you should wear a mask. Did you get much uh, pushback from campers? I, and I know I saw a lot of YMCA photos because Ken was very nice about posting everything these kids do and how much mud they're dragging around yeah. and, and onto the bus and go homes. Uh, mm. Did you get much pushback for masks among kids? Well, we really didn't. Uh, I, I think at that time last year, um, People understood maybe a little bit more the caution, um, uh, so we didn't really have a problem with that. This year will be interesting as more folks have gotten immunized. Uh, the FDA they're looking at uh, reducing that age group. Remember, camp is pretty much six, seven year olds to 13, 14 year olds, uh, so they're under uh, the age rate right, of 16 for vaccination. So uh, it will be interesting to see uh, as more of that age group gets vaccinated, what their response is with the mask. And, and will you and require- It's gonna to continue to change. And will you require your staff to be vaccinated? Is that, is there a policy on how do you deal with employees? Well, there is some CDC recommendation around that, and that is one of the recommendations. We're still waiting for New York State Health Department to tell us exactly what we need to do in New York State. And I know last year when it came to Mustangs and, and you were literally, uh, the county posted signage, please wear a mask, and people were wearing masks, and the leagues were very intense on your parents. If you're coming up, you better be wearing a mask, and if you're bringing yeah. a guest, they better be wearing a mask. Is that still, who enforces that mask protocol? Is that the, the Little League group? I mean, I know it, it flows down, but is it, do you put it on Little League and Mustangs and Pony League to make sure that's in compliance? And do you eject the parents? Uh, we haven't had to eject any parents uh, in the past. Uh, most folks are compliant with it. Um, we, in partnership with the uh, Little League board. They're, it's a definitely a volunteer-driven organization, so they are there on the day-to-day -day basis and, and handling and dealing with that situation. But as we continue to learn more about being outside and who's infected and so on, uh, we'll continue to make adapta adaptations to that. Uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it seems like the, the group size number changes, right, and occupancy size uh, changes. So we're, we're just trying to keep up with that uh, follow the sports uh, and rec guidelines from New York State um, and see them continue to flow and ebb or ebb and flow. So, Audrey, I want to keep before I turn to Dr. Apple with a, a question. I wanted to ask you uh, for people who come to your business, uh, what's the protocol for masks and are they complying? Have you had to tell people we can't serve you because you're not wearing a mask or, or don't you get into that depth? Um, we did last summer, like I said, we, we had masks available. Um, we, we did require masks while you were on shore. Obviously, once you're out on the lake, it's not a big deal. I'm hoping that since they have um, loosened the guidelines for outdoors, um, that it'll be a little bit easier this year. We didn't have a lot of pushback, but we did have some. Um, you know. So one of the upsides for uh, of COVID last year that was at Audrey, I want to, you know, Wasco Paddles did well because there were a lot of people out, out that needed some place to go. A lot more people are staying home, Dr. Eckler. And so they've also taken on home projects. And that is everything from they want their lawns to look wonderful to building projects. And all of those home improvement projects could have an impact on the lake. Am I correct? That's correct. So how so? Well, specifically related to outdoor uh, projects, it's really important to consider recommendations for conservation 
uh, when you're endeavoring upon your, your gardening and or landscaping projects. Uh, the, the council recommends reduced usage of uh, potentially unnecessary fertilizers. Uh, the council recommends uh, the adoption of uh, best management practices, uh, particularly for those who uh, are within the agricultural community. Uh, there are uh, you know, appropriate guidelines in terms of uh, the, the timing and appropriate um, uh, usage of gardening techniques from, from uh, uh, pruning waste disposal, when, when and where to, to dispose of those, those uh, byproducts. Uh, so currently there is an ongoing program called the Lake Friendly Living Program. And I think that, that folks, watershed residents and businesses will see more about this program as we move forward. We're encouraging watershed residents uh, and businesses to adopt recommended practices, uh, again, including reduced fertilizer usage uh, and, and also uh, considering the appropriate disposal of, of waste products. One final question, and I'm going to end with something with Chris and Rain on a second uh, because we're almost out of time. But I want to, uh, Audrey, I want to be in one of the photos that she had uh, shown, and I know this is not controlled by you or your organization, has been the issue of lake level and whether it's high or low. And, and obviously, when it's low, she's got to tether uh, things out. And when it's low, it's tougher for Chris and Serena swimmers, and, and, and there's a float out there and all that. Uh, does lake level, the, the height of the lake, uh, is that, does that impact blooms and water quality as well, whether it's low or high? Yeah, so there are multiple features that, that um, are impacted by lake level. So we work closely with the city of Auburn uh, and their management team uh, that is charged with uh, maintaining lake level. Typically, they try to hold the lake level somewhere between 712 and 713 feet of elevation. Um, just today, I saw they're up to about 1,100 cubic feet per second of flow discharging because of all the rain we had, just to keep it at between 712 and 713. Uh, but to answer your question, so yeah, so when the lake level is down, there are opportunities for watershed managers and also for watershed residents, particularly lakeshore owners, to go out and to rake up uh, decomposing vegetation. To, to pick up trash that litters the shoreline and washes up on shore. Uh, we have also found though, as I reported earlier, that when lake level is down during a dry year, which we, we uh, experienced last year, uh, that there was more decomposition along the shoreline that potentially led to these, these remote uh, HABs occurrences. Um, so I would say consider a low lake level an opportunity to, uh, to take advantage of maintaining your shoreline. Thank you. Christian Serena, I want to finish with you. And this is a little bit of out of literally left field. Uh, last, you mentioned you opened up your season last week. You and your staff happened to be up at uh, Emerson Park to dedicate uh, the season to one of your, uh, unfortunately, the Y lost two uh, great people, Jim Courtney and Steve Kamenecki, but you had you said some very nice things. I wrote you separately about this, uh, about what you had to say about Steve Komenecki and how important he was to your operation up there. Uh, do you mind just talking a little bit about that as we close out? I know that's not on water quality, but I think many of the people in the Wednesday morning roundtable were familiar with both gentlemen. Yeah, I appreciate that, really do. Yeah, it was a, a tough start to 2021, but uh, we did want to take some time and recognize, uh, you know, Steve's commitment to not only the why, but uh, baseball in, in the community. Uh, he's been doing that uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, when he was working with his kids and coaching and, and then, uh, then taking over the Little League uh, maybe 10 years ago uh, to help uh, keep it alive and keep it you know, quite frankly, um, uh, a great program. So, you know, baseball is for me, a very special thing. Uh, for Steve, it was a very special thing. You know, you have the game, but you really have, it's an opportunity for families to be together, laugh, have fun, cry sometimes. 
um, make mistakes and learn from them. And uh, that's how you grow up. And Steve was a, a great example of that with his kids and his family uh, growing up there at the Little League fields. And he modeled all of our, our Y values while doing so. And we wanted to take the time and honor all his time and energy up there with his two sons, Stephen and Casey, uh, got to throw out the first pitch and get a jersey from the Little League with uh, Steve's name on it and uh, his favorite number. So it was just a great time. And we uh, dedicated the whole season to him and, and his time and, and talents and energy and dedication. And as you go up to the park and you see SK yep. uh, on the side of the fields, that's dedicated to him. That's right. Absolutely. And on the back of the jerseys, he's got his initials as well for all the kids. All right. Well, I just, I wanted to finish on that. Yeah. I know he Thanks for bringing that up. To many of the people here. So with that, I want to thank Audrey Wernerke, the, uh, the owner of Owasco Paddles. We do encourage you that this is a for-profit business that's out on Owasco Lake. Uh, she'll be out there hopefully at least by Memorial Day uh, to go out there and try her services and we encourage you to do that. Uh, Chris Nusserino runs a number of programs for the Y, both in Skinny Atlas and Auburn. He is starting to get camp registrations. They are open, so you can yes. get a child that would like to sign up for either of those. And I think in Skinny Atlas, there's science camps and other things that are uh, going out that way. But for the Y at uh, the foot of the lake, uh, you, can, you can watch some Little League there and some baseball. But more importantly, uh, down at the foot of the lake, there are, excuse me, the southern part of the lake, uh, there is right now day camp is assured and they're uh, taking deposits for overnight camp, um, uh, to say the least. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Adam Epler. Uh, with the Owasco uh, Lake Watershed Management Council for joining us again. Uh, he's been a regular guest every couple of years to give us a update on the lake. So thank you all three. We hope you have uh, a great season uh, getting people paddling, camping, and not seeing algae blooms. That's our goal right now. Uh, before we go, a couple of just closing notes. This is our last uh, Wednesday morning roundtable. Uh, for 2020, 2021. Uh, most, all of these have been done by uh, uh, remote and by Zoom. Uh, we can't thank Jesse Klein, who's our coordinator enough for putting these together, uh, uh, who is with the Auburn Downtown Partnership, uh, which we partnered with uh, after uh, many years with the YMCA as the partner on this. And so we wanna thank uh, Jesse for all of her work and Robert Offman, who uh, makes us sound and look good, uh, as we say. Uh, he has been doing this. He uh, also has a, a side business. Uh, maybe that's his real business. Maybe it's not Wednesday morning round table. It's uh, Twisted uh, Vegan, which is a, a vegan cafe that takes place on Wednesdays through Saturdays um, at the Moon Dog Lounge uh, on State Street. So we wanna uh, thank them both for their work uh, and all of you for listening. We'll be back in the fall. Our hope is to have an education program, we think, uh, looking at the, at the new year uh, in September. Our hope will be to be Westminster uh, Church uh, on the Loop Road on William Street, uh, where uh, people will be able to attend us, uh, uh, attend those sessions and get back to some uh, level of normalcy. But I'm Guy Cosentino for the Wednesday Morning Roundtable. We hope you have a great and sunny summer. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was a great program. We really appreciate everyone's time today. And thank you for joining us for this bid program brought to you by Tompkins Trust Company. We'd also like to thank the Allen Family Foundation and the Emerson Foundation for their support. As Guy said, this is our last program for this session, and we'll resume in September meeting in person at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Enjoy your day and hope you all have a great summer. Thanks. <laughs>